you have to have people with the guts and gumption to challenge what's supposed to be and hit it hard and take the lumps. And if if you don't, you know, nothing changes, but you know, they will drag you out the club like Lenny Bruce. They will drag you out like they did uh, Carlin. That might happen, mm -hmm. but you gotta be willing to take that risk if you're going to do that kind of material. Right. Tokyo tonight. Tonight. Hi. Hey, how hey. are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm great. Uh, probably talking too fast, but I'm good. It's okay. I listen <laughs> fast. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Um, why do you know why that is that empty nest is not? Uh... <laughs> no, I don't know. I think it's because I'm on it. I don't think Night Court is running. <laughs> I don't think uh, any of the shows I've done are in reruns. At least I don't get any residuals oh, from them. So that I is, think it's just me. That's a crime. That's that. I'll, I'll <laughs> fix that. I just bought. I bought like the Night Court uh, full set about a couple of years ago. So I hope you got something out of that. If not, I'll. No, 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 no. <laughs> Well, I hope you them. like it, but I oh, I love it. Yeah, I used to watch it when I was a kid. My stepdad loved the show. So, um, but Empty Empty Ness is a great show too. I mean, that was Richard Mulligan was like hilarious. You guys all seem to gel well together, and um, I loved Soap too. That's where I first. Saw I know that. I was such a fan of uh, of uh, Richard Mulligan from from Soap and from mm -hmm. the movies I would see him in. He was he was uh, a wonderful uh, comedian and comedic actor, and. Uh, Working with him, he's probably one of the nicest people I ever met. Wow, that's so good to hear. Yeah. Um, did you, when you were, I always like to ask people, like when you were younger, was that obvious that you wanted to be a comedian, an actress, or did you have any other interests? What was your like main focus? Well, it's hard to say. I didn't, uh, you know, I'm from the south side of Chicago. There's not a lot of opportunity <laughs> for uh, young black kids on the south side to get into stand up. And it, at that time, especially for, uh, girls. Mm -hmm. I mean, there just weren't any moms. Mabley was probably the only uh, black woman doing stand up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it just wasn't something that that I could as aspire to. But I always uh, that I grew up in the era of variety shows. Mm -hmm. And on variety shows, there were always comedians, sometimes two or three comedians. Mm -hmm. And so I watched all of the great comedians of the day on television. And then when I got a chance to stay up late and watch Playboy After Dark, which <laughs> always featured comedians, yep. well as uh, intellectuals pretending that they weren't there to see boobs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to see, you know, Dick Gregory as a young man. I got to see uh, Bill Cosby as a, as a young comedian in uh, David Steinberg and uh, just yeah. everybody uh, came through uh, the variety show circuit. And then when I started doing stand up, the whole the game totally changed. The variety shows were on their way out, even though I did get to do the Alan King show yes. and the Mac Davis show. Right. I was uh, also on the uh, Jim Neighbors show. <laughs> <laughs> I did get to do some of those things, and mm -hmm. the Richard Pryor show was one of the uh, uh, last variety shows, right? Uh, that was that was on TV. So uh, I did get to bridge that little gap, but uh, I, I learned the game from watching uh, comedians on TV do five okay. minutes at a time. That's the the variety shows like when you did Alan King show. I mean, he I feel like he was an old school comic and they're not necessarily the part of the generation that switched from doing personal material was. Did you notice that? Was that a, like a, a kind of a thing when you were like kind of interacting with the older crew? Like, did they respect it? Did they understand it? Well, you know, he was one of those get off my lawn comedians. <laughs> um, yeah. 
And but when he was always very uh, uh, well dressed, and he was very, uh, uh, it was a like a supper club. There was there were supper clubs at that time, mm-hmm. and he was like a supper club kind of comedian. He always had a cigarette, and he was always had a drink. He was a grown up. He was an adult, right. and he was. Uh, pissed off about it. He was, you know, there was the world was changing and these kids and you're robbing me your long hair and you got, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. You know, uh, but it was, it was, like I said, it was, I had the opportunity to kind of come in, uh, in between that hmm. and get to learn from the older comics and see the new direction that it was going in with the advent of the comedy clubs and the stand up comedian as headliner. Stand-up mm-hmm. comedians weren't headliners when I started. Uh, as a rule, the only time they did headline was on variety shows and things like that. But in concerts, they opened for singers. Yeah. On the road with uh, Sinatra or somebody. Had, uh, and that was uh, how, what you aspired to. And then with Pryor, I think, uh, was one of the first people to to headline his own show and have wow. singers open for him. That was unheard of. Wow. Uh, and I think he, I can't remember which tour it was, but he had Patti LaBelle open for him and, and it just kind of turned everything on his head. I had no idea. I always, I mean, we've had comics on here before talk about opening for like Melissa Manchester and kind of going on on the road to do that kind of stuff. But I didn't know that he had switched it. Yeah. I think he was one of the first. Uh, and then, you know, the, it, uh, it changed with the Steve Martins and the Robert mm. Kleins and and those guys were doing um, uh, colleges and and concerts uh, on campuses and things like that. Right. Uh, but in as far as theaters and uh, and doing a theater concert comedy show, mm-hmm. I don't know anybody who was doing it before prior. When was it? Was he also like? When was the advent of the special? When that became like a huge thing? What kind of special? Like a con, like a stand-up special. You know what I mean? Like when did that become such a like? Because now it seems like it was maybe not even now. It might be on its way out. I don't know. But like the um, you know, in the I guess the nineties and then even like early two thousands, like you everybody wanted to have an HBO special. Uh, that happened at the same time the comedy clubs were coming in. Um, uh, cable was coming in, mm-hmm. uh, you know, cable was new in the seventies and as it grew, uh, there were more opportunities for standups and two of the early, uh, standups to, to kind of set the whole thing up were, uh, Gallagher and wow. Elaine Boozler. Ela- yeah. She was fantastic. Elaine Boozler was one of the first to, uh, to have her own series of specials. And uh, and then uh, Gallagher had a series of specials, and then uh, you know uh, uh, Harry Anderson. Oh yeah, uh, had a had a series of specials, and had a, a series where he hosted. Can't think of a name right now. Where he hosted stand-up comedians on uh, HBO or was it what? the Young Comedians? Spe- uh, no, but he did host one, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah, and it was a series. Right. Uh, then it got to be uh, there. There got to be shows, you know, stand-up shows. Mm-hmm. I always ahead of the the curve. Mm-hmm. I got my special on Playboy. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it. My mother saw it, <laughs> and the people who were at the taping, and that was about it. <laughs> Well, I remember seeing you on Comic Relief for the first time. That was the first time I had seen you, and uh, you blew the roof off the place. And I remember laughing so hard. Oh, thank you so much. I it was fortunate. I, but one of the first shows, besides the Merv Griffin show, which was a thing at the time, mm-hmm. um, was Soul Train. Don oh, Cornelius yeah. uh, booked me to do Soul Train about three times. Right. And um, and that was one of my breaks when I first moved to Los Angeles. When you were on the Richard Pryor show, um, was that the first time you felt like this is kind of dangerous? Like, you know what I mean? Like, did you guys all feel the tension of doing something risky? No? Oh, that's great. No. Um, what happened was when Richard got the series, Paul Mooney was one of the writers and mm-hmm. uh, and an, a producer. 
mm-hmm. and uh, he booked the show, the the cast mm-hmm. from the comedy store. He yeah. said, "Y'all could do this as well as anybody else of this. So you do this." And he he uh, booked us at first for individual sketches, you know, to do background or do whatever on individual sketches. And then um, I, from what I understand, Richard said, they can be the regular cast. We don't need to, you know, cast wow. outside. So Robin Williams, uh, Tim Reed, John Witherspoon, Mooney, myself, Argus Hamilton, Sandra Bernhardt, and uh, a bunch of other comedy store regulars got our breaks, our union cards, our, uh, mm-hmm. you know, wow. got validated by being on that show. So was we're it, thrilled. Was the comedy store the first club you were passed at? The comedy store um, was a strange thing for me. I came from Chicago mm-hmm. uh, where Tom Dreesen had been doing a, um, that's how I started. Tom Dreesen had started a comedy Monday night open uh, open mic thing and I started there mm-hmm. and then I started working around uh, I got a, a, a house comic gig nice. at a at a supper club on the south side of Chicago <laughs> uh, Roy show lounge I was the house comic oh, wow. and I was I was doing that uh, but when I got to the comedy store on my birthday in 1976 I was 22 years old. Wow. And uh, I went, and they said, you know, Monday is, op- is open mic. So I signed up to do the open mic. And then um, somebody, I don't know, I never met Mitzi. I didn't meet Mitzi. Wow. Uh, somebody said, well, just call in for spots. And I started calling in for spots, and I got them. That's great. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Did you Did you feel any kind of... Uh... I mean, I remember hearing certain things about uh, the belly room being for the ladies, and then did you did you notice any kind of that mix? Kind of that it no. At the was time it- I started, there was no belly room. The Mitzi did not own the club. She did not own the building. Wow. She uh, had the uh, original room. Okay. And that was it, and wow. um, it didn't happen until uh, three or four years later that. Uh, she bought the building and she had all these other clubs. She had a, the club in La Jolla and then opened one in Westwood. Mm. Uh, but I didn't, I never wanted to do the belly room. I thought the beauty of the comedy store was that it was so diverse. Yeah. There were comedians from everywhere. There was, and it wasn't like, you know, now where you have a, uh, all left-handed Armenian night or uh, (laughs) people with one lip night or in this room and that room. It was like you you would see a a Jewish guy, an Italian guy, a woman, a a black comic, uh, Charlie Hill, Native American. And you got to hear all these different perspectives Mm -hmm. that opened you up to so many different experiences that I, you otherwise wouldn't have. And uh, so when they started that, uh, what I call segregating mm-hmm. comedy, uh, I didn't want any part of it. And yeah, so yeah. I, re- and I also refused to go to the belly room, the little room in the back up the steps around the corner right. where they duck the women is like, I'm not going up there. <laughs> I want to compete with every other comedian. I don't want to be uh, at that time, if, if you weren't in the belly room, mm-hmm. um, the women were novelty acts, uh, and they started setting up the shows with the with the three act comedy clubs right. that came to be with the comedy club in La Jolla and the Laugh Stop in Newport Beach. Okay, and the Improv started opening clubs, and they they it got to be where there'd be an opening act. Mm-hmm. host opening act. Then the middle act was a novelty act. It was either a guy with a trash pack, uh, bag full of props or it was a musical act or somebody, you know, I don't know, blowing bubbles out their nose <laughs> <Somebody>. <laughs> or a girl. Right. And I didn't like that. Right. So uh, Mike Kaylee, I think in Newport Beach, um, 
I went down there when the club first opened mm -hmm. and I talked to him and I said, I, I can do as much time as these guys. I don't want to be the middle act. I want to be a headliner. Give me a shot. So, and he did. Yeah. And so I started headlining at, at that club and then at the punchline in San, in San Francisco. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. The novelty acts are kind of weird. I remember reading in, uh, in one of the standup books that there was a comic who used to swallow cash and i thought what do you close with what do you shit out change like how does that <laughs> how does that act evolve eventually i don't understand <laughs> i don't know but there was a, a guy there was a, a team a black guy and a white guy mm -hmm. i don't know their names but the black guy was conservatively dressed and he would wear like a, a button-down shirt and tie right and the white guy was in a diaper on a leash I don't know what they said or what they did. They came every week, but just the visual and the fact that this man did it. Right. He really did it. And then he would just sit on the stool, I think, and make monkey noises. I don't know. But there were some very bizarre acts that. Uh, oh, my God. That's why you guys were all so strong, though, as comics. So you had to follow some weird shit back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, George you Miller's had... line was, uh, there's some great comics coming up after me, but I'm not going to mention them because <laughs> I'm kind of wrapped up in my own career. And I still think that's one of the greatest lines I ever heard. That's fantastic. Did you have a core group that you would hang out with comedian wise? Well, when I first got there, when I first got to the comedy store, John Witherspoon was working the door. Nice. Wow. And uh, I told him I was just in town from Chicago and I was a comedian. And he said, okay, baby, I'll get you in. And I'm going to in sit in the back and, you know, sit in the back and I'll introduce you to the comedians as they come in. Mm -hmm. And he did. And um, he, he uh, this one guy came in and he said, uh, I want you to meet this new comedian from Chicago. And he said, Marsha, this is uh, Paul Mooney. And Paul said, Mr. Paul Mooney. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. Uh, and then he laughed. And I said, I know you. Mm. And he said, what well, do you mean you know me? And I said, you're on Craps After Hours. I've heard you laugh <laughs> on Richard Pryor's album. He said, ah, ha, ha. And <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. So you went out to uh, L.A. to do that kind of stuff. Did you have it in your mind that you wanted to be an actress still, too, or were you just focused on the comedy? I was a, a stand-up comedian. I never wanted to uh, or even thought about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Shirley Impel was there when I first got there, and she had just gotten um, on uh, What's Happening. Oh. That was great. And, you know, Freddie Prinz was on uh, on Chico and the Man mm -hmm. and comedians with Jimmy Walker would be in the club and he was on Good Times. And so it was starting to be that thing where after a while it got to be where if you did stand up, they would build shows around you and you would play yourself. Sure. Uh, but I didn't really want to do that. Mm -hmm. When I went to San Francisco and won the comedy competition in 79, I got an agent. There was an agent from L.A. and his name was Freddie Amzell. And Freddie was a little cigar cigarette smoking little, hey, kid, come here. <laughs> and he started sending me out on, on uh, auditions. And I'm like, I don't know how to do this. I do stand up. He's like, ah, kid, go on. Mm -hmm. Just introduce yourself. So I started going out on auditions. And wow, that's what happened. That's awesome because you're. It seems like so you had no you had no training then. No, 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 and um, <laughs> I didn't really get concerned about it until I got night court. Okay. Um, when I got night court, I'm walking into a show that was number four in the nation mm -hmm. on the hottest night in TV. No, nobody had ever had a must see TV kind of thing. It was you know. Cosby to uh, what is it? Uh, growing pains, growing pain. Yeah, family ties, family ties, family ties, mm -hmm. and um, it was another one. Cheers, cheers, cheers. <laughs> come up with cheers. Yeah, it was another one. Cheers. <laughs> um, and then Night Court and John Larroquette was winning Emmys regularly. Mm -hmm. The cast was stellar. I mean, and I'm walking in here. I don't know what the heck I'm doing. 
Right. So I decided, I told my agent, I said, Fred, I need an acting class, like quick, because I got the gig. Flo, Florence Halep, the second bailiff, died three weeks before they were supposed to go into production. Wow. wow. So I get this gig right away, bang, bang, bang. I got to figure out what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> and so I go to this acting class and they say, uh, you do the little audition. They're like, oh, you're okay. I'm trying. Uh, but you got to get this book. I read this book. Come back next week. We'll take it from there. Mm -hmm. so I go and get the book. And I opened it up to the first page, to the forward. It said, the key to acting is to keep it simple. Mm. So I closed the book and threw it away and never, <laughs> never ever took another class. Oh, never. that's great. Yeah. I feel like sometimes when you take a class like that or anything like that in the arts, it does kind of hinder because it it's just somebody else's opinion and it puts so much shit inside your own head. It psychs you out a bit. Well, yeah. And actors, you know, can be the opposite of comedians. Yeah. You know, actors agonize over everything. And is it uh, what is it? Is it? is or is it is mm -hmm. is it is or is yeah hmm. and then they go my character wouldn't do that right and i'm like your character doesn't exist your character <laughs> would do anything they write in it this week what the hell are you talking about oh my god i love that you just said that i've had i've had a couple different uh acting you know coaches over the years or whatever and i swear to god it's just a dead end with me not that i should say this <laughs> live or on air but <laughs> cast me um but i uh <laughs> but it is one of those situations where like they would be like no you're not you're not feeling it you're not doing the emotion and i'd be like all right hang on a second and i'd take like a minute and then do it again and be like now you've got it and i'm like i changed nothing it was the same thing. <laughs> I, I feel did. just as shitty as i did before <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know what you just saw but it wasn't it or maybe they're just done with me I don't know. I did uh, I did uh, DC cap. Oh yeah. I, yeah. I don't know what the heck I'm really doing. I'm on night court but I don't really. I mean, I'm in a movie and it's a movie. Yeah. And so I, I the, like the second day of filming Joel Schumacher I go to him and I say, "I don't know, I don't know what to, am I doing this with my character? I don't know." He said, "You know what your problem is?" <laughs> he said, "You think this is important?" <laughs> he said, "Nothing we will ever do here is important. Oh, You're doing man. fine." Wow. That's so. a great that's a great piece of advice. Did you, when you were starting to do stand up, what point in do you think it, it became an evolution for you, or were you always outspoken? Because you're very outspoken now, and I love it. And, but I mean, like, when you were, it's a hard thing, I think, when because I, I remember like talking less about um, how I actually felt or, or even politically on stage when I was younger, because I felt like no one gave a shit with it. Would a 20 year old, because I started when I was 20, and I was like, no one cares. Uh, <laughs> you know, I had a, um, but, but you started when you were 22. Were you, was there an evolutionary process to that or were you always like, you know, spoke your mind, outspoken, had a, had a, the activist, ab you know, ability in you? Well, I, I started when I was 20. Oh, okay. Uh, I moved to Los Angeles when I was 22. Oh, that's, okay, cool. But, um, being a woman mm -hmm. and doing monologues, the only other woman I know who was just doing monologues, grabbing the mic and saying, you know, this is how I feel, was Elaine Boozler. Right. Uh, everybody else, the women I had seen were doing characters. They either became the character, you know, they, they uh, 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 like a Joan Rivers, became Joan Rivers, you know, mm -hmm. and she had a thing and then it was, it was uh, who she was on stage and Phyllis Diller. And uh, they kind of did a lot of self-deprecating uh, humor. Yeah. Uh, Mom's Mabley. She was a character. Mm -hmm. uh, the women, the woman who grabbed the mic and said, my name is what my name is. And this is how I feel. This was brand new at the time. So we basically made it up as we went along. Wow. And uh, just uh, said, however, what we felt. I mean, you, we were making it up. We did it the way we thought we should do it. And it just turned out that way. But uh, no, I uh, just be it on stage was radical. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> was radical. 
So at that point, you just had to go for broke. Whatever you wanted to say was what you were going to say. Yeah. Well, I was, I was, uh, at the time, I didn't know I was gay. Right. And so I was still doing, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, and this guy and that guy stuff kind of stuff. And it, it was a process of, uh, of discovery and becoming myself uh, that led me to be outspoken about different uh, issues. Mm -hmm. But I always wanted to be able to say what I wanted to say the way I wanted to say it to uh, one of the first lines I wrote was about uh, they, uh, the news has a code word for black people, for black men. Mm -hmm. It's youth. Wow. A 35 year old youth mm -hmm. was arrested by, uh, for uh, bothering a 12 year old white man. Right. And so <laughs> it <Yeah>. was. <laughs> um, and now it's the, kind of and, observational. Yeah. You know? That's yeah. crazy that the, that the code word thing has never never changed over time and i mean it's what's what's odd about it too is you think it would they would just drop it at this point because everybody knows so oh, there's no. no real point well suburban moms and soccer moms mm -hmm. and blue collar workers and all of those uh, uh titles uh, supposedly put you in the mindset of a specific type of american we're not talking about black people when we talk about suburban housewives right we're not talking about black people when we talk about blue collar workers no matter how many black blue collar workers they are they are talking about uh bible belt uh, uh voters and so we have a lot of different they have a lot of ways to put us in little boxes that we happily uh you know traipse into and and walk there. out of right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're like fine whatever uh whatever they're gonna label me today um, it, it's weird. Are you kind of, I mean, I've been following like the, uh, CRT stuff, the debates on, on that kind of thing, which is just kind of bizarre to me. People yeah. that I've admired over the years have taken a, a weird stance on it. Like Bill Maher, I feel like has been oddly somewhat conservative about it. I'm not exactly sure why, but I read this great article the other day that kind of crystallized the, um, standardized testing issue for it. I don't know if you've seen or heard anything about sure. that. But it kind of blew me away because it was something I didn't even realize at the time. But they were talking about how it is um, basically geared towards almost like a class warfare thing. And it, and it is a bit racist because, you know, the language that they use in there, like regatta, um, you know, and stuff like that, when they're doing like the word analogies, they're like, if you're, you know, uh, from a suburban, you know, if you're if you're from an urban area or for whatever, you don't know what the fuck a regatta, like, how are you going to, you know what I mean? Like. And it kind of shifted that a little bit. It's it's very interesting. Are you kind of you have any opinions on that? Are you kind of up with all that stuff? Well, okay. CRT when I was a kid mm -hmm. was cathode ray tube, and every Friday you would uh, have to take them out and go to the Rexall and test them to make sure your TV worked. And <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, critical race theory is not a course that is taught in school. Right. It's not taught until, and it's an elective course in college. It's just not something that is, is taught. It's become uh, a code word for uh, American history that includes black people and right. other people. Uh, so they just put everything in there. And that's the history that we, uh, most Americans don't want taught mm -hmm. because it's not, how do I put it? America is very good at hype, very, very good at hype and propaganda, you know, yeah, America, the flag, the thing, and you know, and, and that's what they've sold us. And so we could tell the story of the founding fathers as, you know, some guys beat up some Indians, took their clothes and threw the uh, stuff over the a uh, bunch of drunks, basically, because right. they were mad that they were going to have to pay taxes on their rum. And so, but they don't tell that story. They tell the story, well, these noble men were fighting for no justice. They were a bunch of drunks. Right. And so <laughs> we've been told this history and the people of George Washington was truth teller. George Washington was a slave owner. Yes, slave. Right. You know, people had yeah. actual uh, uh, furniture stuffed with black people's hair. Oh my God, I didn't wow. know that. That was that made it soft and cushiony, and so I mean, it, it the the horrors 
that are real, we don't want to know. Right. And so when you have people, black people and people like me going, well, wait, wait a minute. Right. <laughs> and here's the part of the story. Then you have the suburban housewives going, I don't want my kid to know that their grandfather did that. Right. And I'm sorry. Uh, my kids and the kids I grew up have all known that all their lives. <laughs> and so uh, they've had to deal with that trauma. Yeah. It's your turn now, Karen. Right. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, I completely agree. It's bizarre to me, though. I don't understand what the misconception is. I mean, I understand, like, Ray, like why, like, you know, the people like Fox News do, but I feel like everybody's kind of uh, been a real, real weird about it lately, and I don't understand if it's a money issue or what the general thing is. It's just... It's, it's, it's a lie. Everything is a lie. <laughs> the South is not going to... The South lost. You know, it's <laughs> people today. The South started a war they mm -hmm. lost yeah because they wanted to keep their slaves yeah that's the story mm -hmm. but they have all this we have lost cause where these women said we don't like that story and we don't want our children to know that story so we're not going to teach that we're going to teach that these were noble and and heroic people who did uh, a service and and it's just those mean old northerners who <laughs> were jealous and so they you know they just don't like us so we're going to build statues and we're going to put them everywhere around the country and we're going to build museums and write books and make everybody learn this lie right. and uh, there are so many lies that we're taught that when you start teaching history that includes black people's and native american people's points of view mm -hmm. yeah makes people's heads explode exactly they don't want to hear it and oddly enough i don't remember like i don't ever see anybody's kids feeling shitty about you know what i mean like when we were in school we were just learning what they were teaching us i don't ever think i walked away you know feeling like uh, an overwhelming sense of dread about anything. It was just interesting to learn some stuff about it. I think it's just people's parents who are just like, don't want to hear it from their kids out of just fear of what they might, you know, they might become better people when they get older. Yeah. <laughs> like what's the fear there? You know? have to share. Right. <laughs> don't want to share. And then we don't especially don't want to share with those people. Right. So we can't learn those things. You know? We can't do, you? do that. And my kids can't learn that about right. people, uncle Harry who were uncle you know, Beauregard, who, right. uh, you know, fought in the Civil War on the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> when you're going out to do shows, though, do you find it like the red states to be there? Because whenever I've gone into the red states, I feel like I don't really have much of a choice. But like I've got like pockets of liberals that do come out. And then also, you know, I'm uh, nowhere near your level, but it's like. I've had, you know, you have to be in the audience at a comedy club. So there's Trump supporters there or there's conservatives there and they have no problem being psychotic. Do you still find that when you go out or is it just you, you don't have to deal with that? Well, I haven't really traveled a lot. You know, I took about 20 years, about 15 years off. Yeah. yeah. So I haven't really taken my full show uh, on the road and uh, traveled into enemy territory. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, I find that uh, Vegas, I live in Vegas, Vegas audiences are from everywhere. Yeah. They're not uh, really like Los Angeles audiences are trained and New York audiences are trained from back in the variety show days where they, you know, the light comes on in the studio and it laugh and a ha ha and they know what the rhythms are and they basically know uh what stand up is and how to be an audience. Mm -hmm. Vegas, these are people from around the, the whole country, around the world. They don't always know how to be an audience. And so sometimes you're going to get people who are like, okay, I didn't come here to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go back where you want to hear what you want to hear, because this is what we're going to talk about right now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you take it as, as it as it comes. But I haven't had a lot of pushback. I have had some, mm -hmm. but a lot of that was because I was building an act from scratch. I had, right. you know, when I started again, I started again. I went back to the bars. I went back to uh, uh, just the whatever shows I could do. Mm -hmm. So um, I haven't really had the uh, 
you know, everybody came to see Marsha kind of right. experience in a while. Do you feel like uh, as far as because you've always been outspoken in your stand up and stuff like that, but you also are like on Twitter all the time. And I've, I've, I love your, you're, you're, you're unabashed on the Twitter account. Let's just put it that way. And I love it. But do you, do you pay attention too much to, to the, like, how much of you get invested in that? Cause I, it drives me crazy. <laughs> and I've had to leave a little bit. Do you handle that well? I block them. They get them in there. <laughs> I don't care. I'm yeah. not in it for, you know, I don't have like a billion followers and all that kind of stuff. And I don't, I just don't have time for your, uh, push back in your opinion. You're entitled to your opinion, but you're just not welcome to uh, to spread it here. So right. I'll just block them. I don't care. Do you feel a certain way about stand up in that? Like, because I I know this has been a constant debate though too, and I feel like the lines have shifted. Um, you know, even even politically a little bit, but with the you know the whole uh, woke stuff or PC stuff, where they're like, you know, uh, they'll go after certain comedians and basically accuse um jokes of causing violence which which is odd to me though because you know i feel like 15 years ago the argument came from conservatives where they would be like you know rap music causes violence and so do video games and so do tarantino movies and now it's shifted to the left where they're for some reason attacking entertainers or comedians necessarily which i feel like is just frustration for not being able to take down real politicians so they're like you know what i mean do you ever feel like that where they're like well, we can't get the real guy and this guy fucking pisses me off. <laughs> so we're going to go after who we can. Like, do you ever feel like that? Or do you think, you know, it's all just nonsense? I think the audience is the ultimate ar arbiter. Mm -hmm. you know, it, if they say they don't like it, they have every right not to like it. Sure. I think it's uh, I, I have a problem with comedians going, well, it's just a joke. It's never just a joke. You didn't write it as just a joke. If it was just a joke, you'd stand there with a book and read jokes, knock, knock, who's there? You, It's not just a joke. This right. is how you feel. This is your passion. This is your heart. This is your point of view. Mm -hmm. People are not always going to like it. Right. And so, fine. You know, but there was a time when people would buy fruit and vegetables to throw at you if they didn't like you. There was a time <laughs> when people would send the police to arrest you yeah. on the stage, take you off. There was a time when they had hooks. They would just pull you off the stage because mm. they didn't like you. So uh, the fact that there are audiences who don't like what you do and that everybody is not going to go along, that's part of the game. Yeah. When you're on stage, you can have a great show, a wonderful show, a standing ovation show, and 25% of the audience could hate your guts. Yeah. They won't laugh. They won't stand up. They would, but as long as they don't say anything, right. that 75% is rah, rah, rah. And everybody goes, oh, she's a wonderful kid. And we love her. I love her. And 25% of those people are going to leave and write nasty stuff about you to them. Right. People. That's just part of the game. That's right. Part what you signed up. They don't owe you anything. The audience doesn't owe. They fulfilled their obligation when they showed up. Yeah. That's it. It's on you. They didn't promise you nothing. You promised you were going to be funny. So right. To take those lumps, whatever yeah. they are. It's a good perspective to have. It's not one that I've heard too often because it seems like it's either black and white as far as like, you know, uh, they whether people feel like they're being persecuted or, you know, or they're just like, they're, you know, they're like, who's next on the slabbing table? And you're just like, I don't fucking know. Uh, I mean, <laughs> the Smothers Brothers had their shows canceled. Yeah. The Smothers Brothers. <laughs> we're not talking, you know, we're not talking just like, you know, we know Dick Gregory had problems. We know yeah. Breyer had problems. We know Carlin had problems. But the Smothers Brothers were too political for CBS and for the letter writing people uh, who wrote in. And right. they got canceled and then they got brought back and uh, they still kept going full steam right. ahead with their political point of view. Yeah. And so it's a it's a risk we all take. It's right. a risk we've always taken, you know, prior show prior did four shows out of a, a, a you know, they, they don't give you contracts for four shows. Right. Uh, they they give you a contract for a season for five years or so. I mean, they signed them up for much longer than four freaking shows. Right. 
but the shows he delivered that we see as classic nowadays mm -hmm. were too much for the network and they yanked him. That's just part of the game. It just happened. It is. I think what's frustrating sometimes is I feel like the right is uh, kind of disingenuous when they when they talk well i mean I, I, in many ways but i feel like in this way in particular because i feel like they kind of use um you know uh, the left's somewhat over sense extreme and oversensitivity for what it appears like to recruit people to the right that drives me crazy because i feel like they're not really on your side i don't know why people don't really understand it but they do kind of use it in that way and i see a lot of um it frustrates me because when i'm in the clubs or whatever i see a lot of comedians feel like they identify with the right more. And I want to be like, you really don't. Uh, <laughs> but there's no way to, there's no way to make that clear. It's, 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 it's frustrates the hell out of me. I also think there's a lot of unifying things in comedy. We actually had a comment from a fan just now that he said he, he's a Republican, but he loves Marsha. And he said, <laughs> absolutely. You may disagree on issues, but she has been nothing but respectful to me. She has always been her authentic self. And that's a beautiful thing, hmm. which is interesting, right? That's a, yeah. it's, it's a nice right. thing that we can unify through comedy as opposed to it always having to be something that's separating. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, I mentioned Charlie Hill mm -hmm. the, earlier. And Charlie used to come on stage uh, with his hair, you know, native. No question he's a native uh, indigenous person. And he would come out on stage and go, hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? <laughs> and he'd say, my name is Charlie Hill. And I went to Custer Memorial, Memorial Junior High. And that smacked me in the face with a reality that I had never considered. And I asked him, did you? He said, yes, I really went to Custer Memorial Junior High. Wow. That shifts your whole way of thinking about what it means to be a Native American in America. Right. Uh, and so, uh, you have to have people with the guts and gumption to challenge what's supposed to be and hit it hard and take the lumps. And if, if you don't, you know, nothing changes, but you know, they will drag you out the club like Lenny Bruce. They will drag you out like they did uh, Carlin. That might happen, mm -hmm. but you gotta be willing to take that risk if you're going to do that kind of material. Right. When you were um, uh, going back to acting for a little bit, when you were doing that kind of stuff, was there somebody that you kind of emulated a little bit maybe in the beginning? Cause I feel like we all draw from someone. And since, you know, uh, you had kind of gone into it where you said you, you just went from stand up straight into acting. Was there somebody that you were kind of like had in the back of your head? Well, I don't know that there were, there was anybody I had in, in the back of my head as far as acting. Because acting, for me, like I said, had to be a natural thing or I don't know how to do it. Sure. If, if it's not just, you know, organic, I don't know. But as a kid, I used to watch Eve Arden on TV. She was on a show called Our Miss Brooks. Okay. And she was very deadpan. Mm -hmm. And uh, she could kill you with a look. <laughs> and then as I got older, uh, teenager. Mm. Flip Wilson was my first real comedy crush. Oh, nice. I really loved Flip. He was clever. And he would do outrageous puns, really bad puns. Mm -hmm. But he would, he would build these stories around this pun that were just brilliant. Mm -hmm. And in those stories, he had a character. When he would do a woman, he would, he would you know, do a falsetto voice. Chris gonna find Ray Charles. <laughs> and that character came to be Geraldine Jones. Right. Geraldine Jones was the only black woman I had ever seen speak her mind, stand up for herself, mm -hmm. and and not back down. I admired that very, very much. And it was, uh, it, it kind of gave me license to, well, okay, I'm a real girl. I'm gonna do that <laughs> myself. Uh, and I never got a chance to talk to him or meet him and tell him that, but he was uh, a big, big part of uh, who I am. That's great. 
Yeah, and I, prior, of course, prior. Sure. Prior, right, yeah, right, yeah. Prior, was the <laughs> person I knew of who spoke like um, like people I knew. Uh, right. We had this, um, you know, as a black person, you have these two sides. You have your, uh, you know, your accommodating side, and you speak in your uh, code switch voice, and you know, and then you talk to your friends. You know, you have your uh, colloquially. Mm -hmm. Richard spoke to everybody, right? In uh, uh, black people's voice, and I, that just blew me away. That just that just uh, was very liberating, and uh, and I admired that very much about him. Yeah, I think to this day, I think the honesty is the thing that still blows me away about all of his stand-up specials. Is that there was just nothing left on the table. He talked about all his, you know, insecurities, his mistakes. He, like even even the fact that he talked about trying to shoot two women running out of his house and missing and hitting his car. Like, who would think to just open up about that? Make well, it, make to do that, I mean, come on, yeah, who, who's gonna shoot a car? <laughs> I got a gun, I got a car, boom, boom. It's not uh, right, but, uh, yeah. he was not. Uh, and I find a lot of comedians don't really understand that, yeah, that uh, that he was never afraid to be vulnerable, right. and that vulnerability is a part of a big part of stand up, uh, uh, and as well as honesty, but you have to be willing to to uh, expose yourself. You also have to have a certain amount of grace. Mm -hmm. You have to have a certain amount of class. Yeah. Because if all you're doing is pushing the envelope, there's no point. I mean, you're just pushing it for nothing. If you have a point to make though, and the envelope edges in the way, mm -hmm. yeah, you got to kick it over. Right. But you have to have enough discernment and enough concern for uh, truth and feelings and and all of that to take everything into account and in, and and then say what you have to say and I think Richard doesn't get enough credit for having as much class mm -hmm. as he did. Um, a lot of the things that were uh, most I don't know objectionable were very compassionate. Yeah. Uh, to an underdog, to somebody who was, wasn't being treated fairly. And then he would go after whatever it was full bore, yeah. but not just going after things and saying outrageous things for the sake of saying them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of people get confused with that. Yeah, I agree. They don't seem to like he, there was a lot of his, uh, in his stand up that was confessional, but he also felt like he was, learning something along the way, like about himself. Like he was never just like, this is me. And that's the end of it. He was like, this is me. This is what's wrong with me. This is why, you know, it was all layered and it was just done so incredibly well. I was reading an article recently and not even to pit them against each other necessarily, but just about what you're talking about, the vulnerability of Richard prior. Um, and then how, uh, Eddie Murphy was none of like, he was, you know, very, very funny, but he had a bravado. Like there was always that wall there. You never really saw any vulnerability there. He pretended to be the tough guy while Richard was just stripped down. And I, I didn't, I don't think I realized that when I was a kid. No, I, it's a part of, you know, we sit up and we analyze stuff that people don't pay any attention to. <laughs> part of our job. Yes. And it's part of our own psychosis and who we are. Yeah. But uh, when you, when you watch the greats, they have an element of compassion. They have an element of of, uh, of caring. Mm -hmm. you know, Reine, uh, Reinhold Wiggy was the uh, writer, uh, producer, executive producer at Night Court. Oh, yeah. And yeah. he said, don't you guys care about nothing? <laughs> uh, you know, when you get scripts, you know, don't you care about nothing? Comedy has to care, <laughs> you know, you gotta really care. And if you're just saying things to be outrageous, uh, that gets old and the audience is not going to, to stay with you. But if you're saying things that you really care about, even people who don't agree with you mm -hmm. will give you uh, a little leeway yeah, because they understand that, that this is uh, something that's, that affects you, that's passionate, that's honest. And that that uh, you need to say, and it might be something they've never heard or considered before. Right. And uh, those uh, 
you know, that kind of understanding that really underneath it all, most comedians are pretty nice people. I yeah. say we're, we're disappointed op optimists who can't fight. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's so true. That hit me harder than I thought it was going to. Um, yeah. Do you, do you remember a point in your career where you felt like it, um, you were really maybe in your head at the time where you were like, Oh my God, I made it. Like I figured out the, the stand up, who I am and what everything is. Was it like, uh, a point where you were on stage or maybe just in your career? Well, there came a point uh, before I retired uh, where it got too easy. Wow. Uh, I felt like I knew what I was going to do. I felt like I had every joke, every line. Um, I knew, I just knew what I was doing. I've got, it wasn't so much that I felt cocky. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, felt like I had worked this material. I know this material. I went blah, 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 and that I could put in new jokes and they would work because I just knew what I was doing. And then uh, my life crashed and I, I didn't know shit after that point. And so, like I said, I had to start all over again right. and relearn it and uh, and kind of miss that that feeling of uh, now nah, I got this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, uh, to the point where, I don't know if I got this, but this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> Did you find yourself kind of enjoying the rediscovery of the process again? Oh, very much. I, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's strange when you, when you start again, mm -hmm. you know what to be afraid of, but you rediscover what it is this good and what, uh, what it is that, that you're doing, right. you know, yeah. and why you're doing it, and so I've 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 rediscovered me um, in the process of of uh, being on stage. It's such an, uh, you know, you're on stage. You have no defense. You have no barriers. You have nothing. It's you and the audience, and it's a very honest interaction. Mm -hmm. And so you have to know who you are, right? Because the audience sees who you are, whether you know who you are or not. Right. They see everything. And uh, I see comics sometimes think they're hiding stuff, you know, or, 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 or pass gas and think nobody say <laughs> They saw everything. <laughs> they saw you decide that you weren't going to say anything about it. Uh, right. So uh, it's just relearning and, and uh, rediscovering what it is that's fun about it, what's mm -hmm. uh, good about it, what's exciting. Did it, uh, w was that a big part what, um, when you came out in 2017? Was that a bigger part of it, do you think? Well, yeah, it was part of me um, uh, finding my courage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we're in the closet out of fear. Sure. Um, and I I put up a TikTok, uh, say, when it National Coming Out Day, explaining why I come out. And uh, people would, were commenting, we knew. <laughs> that pissed me off. It pissed me <laughs> off because it totally discounts the reasons why people are in the closet in the first place. Right. Like yeah. saying, um, yeah, my husband beat me up every day and having people go, oh, we knew. What the hell you mean you knew? <laughs> that's, not, that's not the right answer, even if you did know. Right, yeah. You didn't know. And, right. and it wasn't that I was trying to not be myself. It was that I wasn't allowed to be. The 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 society said you can't be that. In fact, I as I said earlier, I had to discover that. Mm -hmm. I just knew I was different. That's right. what they told me. You're different. You you know. And I I didn't really uh, the girly girl thing was I couldn't I didn't like that at all. <laughs> and the, my boys are you're stupid. And I <laughs> felt like I didn't know. And then you know, and oh, I saw a boob. What do I do with that? I mean, <laughs> it was uh, I'm I, right there with you. Still. And who do I talk to? Mm -hmm. You know, and there was nobody, and I yeah. had to figure it all out. Yeah. Once my boyfriend told me I was gay. <laughs> <laughs> um so you're doing uh you started doing funny women of a certain age that's coming out november 24th yes. um was it uh was was it the process like coming up with material for that specifically did you have to hone a new set for that did you go out into the clubs and work it out what was your uh kind of process for doing that i was uh doing nick 
Nick Cannon's Christmas movie, Miracles Across uh, 125th Street mm -hmm. in Atlanta, uh, and doing um, uh, Hope Flood's uh, uh, Comics Rock convention mm -hmm. uh, in Atlanta. Uh, and so I, I went three weeks there and working every day doing that. And then uh, the last week had to take two days off to fly to uh, California wow. to do uh, funny women of a certain age and then fly back to Atlanta oh to God. finish the movie. So I didn't really have time. Wow. To, uh, you know, so I took a chunk that I know. And uh, fortunately, because uh, I'm just coming back, it is stuff that most people haven't seen. Mm -hmm. So, but it was stuff that I knew and knew would uh, would work. So, and it fit because I am uh, hopefully a funny woman of a certain age. I mean, absolutely I'm a demographic. You know, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, a couple of things. First, I, I I'm so bummed that I didn't get to go to that one because I went. I'm I'm friends close with Carol, as you know, and I went to the last one, and then this one was in L.A. and I couldn't make it out to that one. And then plus I knew you were there. They said you absolutely crushed, by the way, which I'm so bummed. I did not get to be there live for it. I'll see it when I it comes out. To watch. I know I'm going to watch for sure. Everybody the other thing is, to watch. <laughs> the other thing is, though, too, is I love that you just said you had other things to do and you had a chunk that you were confident in because you were just talking about how you left because stuff became too easy. And then you had to rework the process. Are you now back at the point where you are confident in anything like you just know it's funny? I'm funny and that's it. No. Okay. No. Because that's I incredible am, that you went and did that without actually honing anything. I'm building a show mm -hmm. called The Book of Marsha. Okay. And it's a, a self contained one woman show, mm -hmm. one woman stand up. I am the entire show. And uh, it uh, is not just a one woman play like, you know, Whoopi did with various vignettes and stuff like that. Right. It's pure stand-up, mm -hmm. but it, uh, it covers the, a lot of uh, uh, changes and things I've seen uh, over my life. You know, I, I start by saying, I'm the same age as Oprah Winfrey. We were born a couple of months apart in the year of Brown versus the Board of Education. Wow. And we go from there. And uh, uh, just the humor comes from that. And then... Uh, what it's like to be a black gay woman who grew up during Jim Crow and the, and the civil rights uh, movement in Chicago and became who I am. <laughs> and so uh, I'm looking forward to putting that out. And uh, I'm also, this has nothing to do with stand up. I'm also <laughs> passionate about Black History Museums. And I just got to go to the Jim Crow Museum of uh, Racist Memorabilia at Ferris State University in Big Rapids. Wow. And uh, they're expanding. There's so many. They have thousands upon thousands of, of things from that era that are just um, at, like these were industries that people actually had making these horribly uh, offensive, uh, terrible images of a race of people. Right. And uh, we need to preserve that. And they, they're in the midst of expanding. And of course, there's fundraising. And if you can donate, please do. Uh, but uh, just being in the museum and imagining that how much more they have to display and mm -hmm. walking around there uh, is something everybody needs to do. Uh, yeah. just so we can see the reality of who, who we are or else we'll never get better. And uh, my bucket list is to visit every black history uh, museum in the country. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully I can do it as I travel, you know, yeah. as I, or if I'm, you know, and so I was supposed to be in Detroit and I got to go to that one in the Wright Museum, which is another museum in Detroit proper. Mm -hmm. And, uh, all the major cities have one, and I can't wait to uh, tie that in in yeah. uh, in the stand up and the tour. I was going to ask, me how many point. are there in the U.S.? Oh, yeah. Sorry, hmm? how many? Are oh, there? I was going to ask, how many are there in the U.S.? I don't know how many total, but there are more than you think. You know, the um, the National Museum of African American History 
at the Smithsonian in Washington, uh, Chicago. I became familiar with black history museums in Chicago, the DuSable Museum. Uh, is big. In fact, the Wright Museum said they got their inspiration from the DuSable Museum. Uh, they uh, just did the Equal Justice Museum uh, in uh, Memphis, and there's the uh, in Atlanta, the Civil Rights, there are a bunch of museums dedicated to that. And then what I missed, I missed the Motown Museum in Detroit. That's a piece of black history too. And uh, yeah. you know, they're all bigger and smaller than when I was in Kansas City. I got to go to the Jazz Museum and the Negro League uh, Baseball Museum. Mm. These are smaller museums, but they still tell a story and a part of a story that gives context to uh, things that you otherwise might not have. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I just enjoy seeing those moments preserved and, and uh, sharing them with people. So uh, that's a big part of what I uh, hope to uh, be able to do with the stand-up alone. Please, please tell me you're pitching this as a, as a history I channel was show. The same thing. Travel, do stand-up, and then go to these museums with Marsha Warfield? Come on, I would watch that. I'm ready. I'm ready. I Let's would do love it. to do it. Yeah. We'll cut this part out and we'll send it to <laughs> <laughs> This part's going maybe, to a network. <laughs> maybe somebody will know somebody who'll tell the guy. You know, I know a guy. Oh, uh, I would love to go to the jazz. I, I, uh, Tony Woods took me to my first jazz club. Um, I don't know why I never went to one on my own before, but I was in D.C. doing shows. Tony was there. I don't know if you know, you know, when you go out with Tony, that's the whole night's gone. Uh, so, so, uh, but he, it was like, we did, I did like, a uh, a weekend at this one club and he was in the area at another club. And then he had like texted me and he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm going home. And he's like, no, you're not. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you asked me what I was doing. If you're going to tell me what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I love, I, I really enjoyed it a lot. And I, it was my first time going to one and it was a blast and I'd love to go to a museum and just kind of, I'm slowly dipping into, I have a friend, Joe Starr, who, um, I think your manager knows as well um loves jazz and he's always sent me some stuff recently so it's kind of new for me i started in jazz clubs uh, uh, in addition to the the comedy clubs that were new there were a lot of jazz clubs and like i said supper clubs and stuff mm. so uh and chicago's a big jazz town so yeah. i got to uh to work in in a lot of uh, jazz clubs when i got to la we found a uh, few uh, rooms that featured jazz there was a uh, place called the Parisian Room, and they would let comedians work there. I worked there, and uh, I just love the, um, they're usually smaller mm -hmm. uh, and more intimate, and the audience is uh, our listeners. You know, mm -hmm. they, they're they they're not the kind of people who hear music and go, rah, 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 or snap. <laughs> they don't, don't want to dance. They don't want to, they just want to sit and listen. And so they're perfect audiences for comedians. And uh, I would yeah. love to do that too, do uh, smaller, uh, intimate uh, venues of grown yeah. and sexy people. Oh man, we got so much stuff to work on now. That's great. <laughs> I like I said, we, by the way, I'm like, I'm including myself in this. You're like, I'm never going to see you again. Uh, <laughs> I accept all help and all good wishes. So I appreciate it. Fantastic. Uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer. And I got to ask, is there anything you can tell us about upcoming 911 that we can know now? Or is it all hush hush? I am not supposed to even mention that okay. I'm on 911. <laughs> all right, all right. I won't. But, uh, <laughs> I think it'll be a very good episode. I hope it will be. You know, you oh, never it's gonna know. Be. But I hope it'll be a very good episode for. Uh, I get to work with uh, great, great people, great actors. Very intimidating, you know. I'm sitting mm. uh, there and they all know what the heck they're doing. Angela Bassett, come on, Angela Bassett, what the hell? Right. <laughs> and, uh, she does a line and then it, I'm supposed to do a line now? <laughs> I, mean, I haven't felt that kind of pressure since I did Coke. And um, so, but Aisha Hines is wonderful and I get yeah. to play her mom. And um, I think it'll be a, a real good episode for her, my character, Tony. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. I can't wait. 
Um, and I got a question for you, stand up wise too. I've got a couple that we ask every guest, but this one is is just separate. Does I for me, I've been doing it like 16 years, and I know I've talked to you know various stand ups over the years or whatever who've done it. Does that feeling of uh, like right before I get onto a stage, my brain will literally go, "Who the fuck do you think you are?" <laughs> <laughs> and it's always right before where I'm like, oh, should I fucking run? I don't know what, you know, and you go ahead and do it anyway. Does that ever go away? No. <laughs> no, not at all. In fact, uh, the, I had some wonderful mentors and uh, had the, the uh, I was blessed to have people older than me. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you talk about stage fright and the nerves and stuff, and they said, it just means you're ready. That's your body getting ready. And it's just saying, okay, come on, step yeah, up. Yeah. Go. Oh. And so always I embrace it. Yeah. Uh, nice. it's strangely, it's like, again, that was part of what happened when it got too easy. Uh, right. there, that wasn't there. That's, it was just, yeah, okay. Hi. And it got to be patter. Yeah. It does scare <laughs> the shit of you when, you when it's not there, when you're like, I'm way too calm. No. <laughs> and so I kind of, I'm happy to have that. Yeah. Right, you know, and you hear your name and boom, you go. Yes. Yeah, I used to have people go, why are you pacing? I'm like, why? Because I'm I'm like, you know, there's energy coming up. There's a huge bunch of people. I'm about to go do a thing. I'm going to black out for like, you know, 40 minutes and then wake up and it'll be over. <laughs> and hopefully I'll collect a check. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That is the ultimate hope at the end yeah. of it. And that's not always guaranteed. <laughs> oh, my God. I know. And I'm like five foot four. So, like, it's a harder. I feel like when you're, you know, when you're a dude and also tiny. <laughs> um, people are like, why are you asking me for money? And I'm like, well, I just did a thing, mister. Uh, no matter how old I am. It's not just us. I've been on the road with people. Uh, you you was like, didn't they get their money in advance? No. Uh, and, uh, you know, all kind. there are all kinds of stories about uh, people not getting paid. So yeah, um, there are no guarantees in this business. It's kind of, you know, we're just, we're just one level up from street thug, you know, <laughs> as far as <laughs> what we do. Uh, so. Yeah. It was this or busker for me. So I, I get it. I was about to say, remove the walls and you're a busker. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I need to learn sleight of hand real quick. Well, you know, Char uh, uh, Harry, and Michael Collier and uh, yeah. the people were all street performers. Yeah. Uh, and uh, nobody was better than Charlie Barnett. Uh, Charlie Barnett was in DC Cab mm -hmm. and he played the, the lead. But Charlie was a, a stand up who never relied on an audience or show it. He would go to the park and get a garbage can lid and make that his base and, and start pulling people. And doing a show, and wow. he'd make $1,500 lunchtime <laughs> just from wow. doing oh my shows God. and people throwing money at it. That's incredible. I wish I learned how to do that kind of stuff. We had Jeff Altman on, and he can do the sleight of hand stuff, and, and he was just, uh, it's impressive. I don't know how anybody does it. Yeah. Well, I've um, known Jeff, too, since the early <laughs> days. He was, he was in the club when we, uh, when we started. Yeah, we had recently we had a, a really good run too. We had Jeff uh Jeff Altman was on, Rich Scheidner was on, all just all of you guys are amazing. Um I gotta ask you the last two questions. Sorry, I kept you a little over. Um no, I was just gonna interject oh, sure, go real fast. I just wanted to put a couple of the fans have been putting in a whole oh, bunch sure. of comments that are filing through, so I just wanted to put them up for them. That Mike Rose said, uh, you're hilarious. Thank thank you so much <laughs> for it. And he also asked, Does Ru Ruby Begonia <laughs> Bell? <laughs> that was one of those long, long pun. I mean, the setup to the pun was uh, in, encyclopedic. It would just went on and on. And it did, dude, Ruby Begonia ring a bell. We had come <laughs> to seize your berry, not praise it. I mean, it, it was just uh, brilliant the way he, he was so freaking clever uh, at a time when clever black men were a novelty. Um, people don't understand that uh, before the 60s, uh, we were just bridging from, there were people still doing blackface, black comedians still doing blackface in the early 60s. Pigmeat Markham still did uh, blackface and uh, Nipsey Russell kind of bridged the, the gap from the baggy pants 
comedy to the newer uh, stand up, uh, speak your mind kind of comedy. And uh, so uh, uh, Dick Gregory in a suit and tie with a cigarette and a drink. Whoa, this was game changing. And uh, he and, and, uh, and people like, like, uh, Flip and and Cosby uh, doing intellectual things and not just sight gags and and uh, you know accents and stuff. Right. This was huge. This was new. It was almost <laughs> as new as a woman having uh, an opinion and the confidence to express it in a mixed audience. Wow, wow. that's the, this was another great question that we missed. I apologize. How did Miss Warfield like working with Della Reese when she played her aunt in Night Court? That must have been amazing. Della Reese. I absolutely love Della Reese. I was so uh, blessed and uh, excited when she agreed to do the show. And I just saw uh, that I also did a touch by an angel uh, called The Quality of Mercy, uh, that she was the star. Just being around Della Reese was amazing. She was the first uh, black woman and maybe the first woman to have her own talk show. Um, she was just a uh, wonderful, strong, confident, beautiful uh, presence. And uh, she had a wonderful sense of humor and uh, great singing voice. And I have a, there's a YouTube of her when she was like 29 and she's singing Someday uh, You'll Want Me to Want You. And it's so amazingly adorable. It's just yeah. wonderful. I love Dar Della Reese. Yeah, she was a force of nature. Sorry about that, John. I want to let you get back. No, to no, it's fine. I'm happy to uh, give our fans a chance to talk yeah. to the amazing Marsha Warfield. You really are. So, you have so much. I wish we had another 10 hours. To spend I know. With you, I, I, I was like, I have night. no problem keeping her longer. Keep going with the comments. On the <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, really I, can I can talk. Thank you, man. My mother let me know. Yeah, you can. You can talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the la so the questions that we always ask every guest, there's a, a couple, and one the first one is if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what kind of advice would you give that would help you out today? I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't know the things I know if I, somebody had told me uh, what to be scared of. My the greatest uh, blessing, I think. Uh, that I had was that I was too stupid to be scared. Okay. I was I, I was traveling all over the country by myself, uh, going to places where I was the only black person in town. Not just in town, but in the I mean, in the surrounding areas. Right. And uh, I was just uh, too naive, too stupid to be scared. So. I don't know that I want to tell my younger self anything. I would like to watch her and go, hmm, you, you're pretty bad at it. <laughs> 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 I would give myself a little more confidence than I might have otherwise. I love that. That's a great, that's a great answer to go back and just, just cheer on yourself as an older version of yourself. That's great. <laughs> um, and the other question is what had to end in your life, either good or bad, uh, that led you to where you are today? My mother and my aunt died. Oh, wow. In 1995, uh, my aunt was like my, um, you know, my mother and my aunt were my biggest cheerleaders and uh, they were my my family I depended on. And uh, they both passed away within two months of each other. My aunt died in October. My mother died in December. I'm sorry. To hear that. And uh, I was an adult for the first time. Hmm. And I didn't have, didn't know what to do. There was nobody, you know, when I got the Richard Pryor show and I I had to do the scene, the eating scene where we don't have any dialogue. And I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And, I, but I got enough sense to know that I'm the, the, um, the straight woman here. I got to drive this scene and I don't know what I'm doing. I called my mother my mother. And now when I have these kind of challenges, you know, I kept saying, I, I wish when my mother died, I'm like, I wish I could call mama and tell her my mother died yeah. because I, I didn't have any, anybody. So that was the, the thing that ended that changed 
everything. Wow. Wow. Well, uh, seriously, thank you so much for coming on. I wish we, again, I wish we had more, more time because uh, you're amazing. And it was thank just a you. real, real joy to have you on. And an honor. For sure. Yes. I'm honored too. And we're going to get that History Channel show going. <laughs> yeah, so. you know, get that out there. All right. <laughs> I'm ready to I, go. I, I want to ask if you, because I feel like it's such an introspective journey, like for yourself that you're doing it for. Like, would you want to tape it if you were on it? Because I feel like it's something that people would want mm. to join you on that journey. I would love it. I mean, that's, you, you just, you just, uh, you just saw into my soul. I guess I'm not very, uh, uh, I'm not real good at hiding it, but that's like, you know, the bucket list, bucket list. Yeah. And, uh, I think it's so, so natural and so necessary and it could be so fun and interesting. And uh, it's, these are things that we all need to see and celebrate. You know, we had a whole history, a whole segment of history dedicated to making fun of black people. Mm -hmm. and Distorting and impressing it, but making fun of black people and to be able to take people around the country to these these wonderful museums that show exactly how people have triumphed and and just celebrate them would be an honor. It would yeah. be tremendous. Absolutely. And a moving experience. I have a really I have a very close friend. I actually had lunch with him earlier today. So and he's a person of color and he had gone to South Africa and he said one of the most moving experiences he ever had, which he didn't realize because of his age and being in this country. He went to the apartheid museum. He was like, and it was mind blowing. He was yeah. like, it was mind blowing. He's like, you felt like you felt it. Yes. So yeah. it's, and it's, it's, you know, it's about triumph. It's not about suffering. You know, they showed that they showed the struggles and the reality and the burden. I mean, it was amazing burden. It, it is an, it was an ongoing Holocaust mm -hmm. and uh, they showed that, but the triumph of just survival and yeah. then to take it to the places that that black people have gone and we could just you know stop with the presidency or you can stop with whatever with building uh, a genre the hip-hop they built a genre out of spare parts you know old turntables and exported it around the world it's in a it's a thing around the world and to just celebrate the triumphs that uh that people have had. That's not just all about you know coming out of misery. To, oh, we so poor. <laughs> <laughs> but no, 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 no. Right. Hey, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, to be able to do that uh, for people would be amazing to me. Awesome. Absolutely. We're gonna work Absolutely. on this, John. Thank yeah. you so much again, Marsha. We looking forward to seeing you again, and we're gonna make sure we check you out on, on 911 and more funny women of a certain age. And whenever you start touring, let us know. We're gonna be there. Yes, All right. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Dystopia tonight.